Hi, I'm Jen, and welcome to Christian Fire Poppy. Thanks for joining me today as we ponder on how all things denote there is a God. We will be examining signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth, looking for connections to furnish our minds with continual reasons for giving thanks and worshiping God. The glory and signature of his hand is all around us. In fact, as I looked at the clock right before recording, I realized that today is 2 12 20 24 at 12 o'clock noon exactly, which is exciting because 2024 is a big year. A lot of us can feel it, and I can't wait to talk about the April 8th, 2024 eclipse that helps make this year and mark it as being marvelous. I discovered some very exciting connections linking the great American eclipses to the final dispensation of time that we know and have been told by prophet and apostles that we are living in now. I can't wait to show you how the eclipses, if we choose to see the parallels, can point our minds to various things that include holy sites, holy times. We have President Nelson's 40th anniversary of becoming an apostle of the church, the 10 tribes, the 10 lost tribes, is Ezra's eagle, the upcoming general conference, the last day's cedar tree that the scriptures call it a riddle or a parable, the cross of peace, Egypt, and the Jonah sign. So, in this video, I do not make any claims of specific events occurring on the exact eclipse date fast approaching. Rather, I see it as a sign for the season. So myself, I just really love to look for connections and symbols that reveal the glory of God, liken the scriptures to myself, support the teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and highlight events that we already know from scripture that have and will happen in his time and in his way. And that is the beauty of teaching and learning through symbols and parallels. We get to choose what to take in and what we consider as to be significant. So if you don't find any of it significant, that's okay. You don't have to. And as a disclaimer, I'm sorry about the commercials. My channel is not monetized and I have zero control over that. I'm not an official spokesman for the church. And these are just my own ponderings and study that I'm sharing with you today. So let's dive in. So we are going to be taking a look at one of the most amazing things about this upcoming eclipse is that the path of the solar eclipse totality crosses over six different very important church sites. And if you look at this article from Forbes, it's titled at least 32 million people will see the great North American eclipse. This will be the most watched celestial event in history. So how interesting that at our last general conference, our prophet tells us to think celestial, and that is right before one of the most watched celestial events in history here over America. If you go back to the first American eclipse on August 21st, 2017, you can see that the path of totality crossed over three other very important church sites. So really quick, we have the church sites being crossed include Palmyra, Fayette, Kirtland, Menden, Hiram, Amherst, Adamon Dayaman, Independence, Missouri, Far West Missouri, and we are going to dive into this more, but let's continue on. I want to give just a little bit more of an intro so you can see what we will be examining. Some of the things I will be sharing with you, I discovered completely on my own, whereas others, I found that many other Christians are seeing these parallels and these symbols and posting about them online. But this one about all the seven dispensations, dispensation heads um, was something original that I found, and I thought it was really, really cool. You can see there is a city named Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, the body of Christ, and Joseph. Now, for the dispensation when Jesus was alive, there are no cities in the United States named Jesus, and the closest thing to it is Corpus Christi, body of Christ. And that was right 
at the crossing of the eclipses down below in Texas. Then you have Joseph, who is in the Utah area, and all of these are located within this path of totality or very near. It looks like Noah is the only one that is close to it. And if you, all the cities located close to the path of totality will still see a major beautiful eclipse. They won't just see it 100%. 100% is for the path of totality. So I was able to find these places by going to geotarget, dot com to look up the cities and We're going to be talking about how God uses celestial signs. So in Alma 30, 44, I love the scripture. It says, will ye say, show unto me a sign when ye have the testimony of all these, thy brethren, and also all the holy prophets, the scriptures are laid before thee, yea, and all things denote there is a God. I love looking for all things that denote there is a God, yea, even the earth and all things that are upon the face of it, yea, and its motion Yea, and also all the planets which move in their regular form to witness that there is a supreme creator. So here in the Book of Mormon, it's telling us to look for signs on the earth and in the way that the earth and the sun relate to each other in their movements. So in Joseph Smith translation, Luke chapter 21, 25, it says in the generation in which the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. So let's take a look and ponder on these signs. We were also told by George Q. Cannon in the Journal of Discourses that the greatest events that have been spoken of by the holy prophets will come along so naturally as the consequence of certain causes that unless our eyes are enlightened by the spirit of God and the spirit of revelation rests on us, we will fail to see that these are the events predicted by the holy prophets. One man's eyes will be open to see the hand of God in all these events. He will notice his movements and providence in everything connected with his work, and they will be testimonies to him to strengthen his faith and to furnish his mind with continual reasons for giving thanks to and worshiping God. So praise be to God. I love looking for these connections and providences so that I can give glory to God. Um, I find it to be a lot better than being skeptical all the time and saying that has no meaning. So at times I may make connections that are just coincidences and don't have meaning, but even still, I'm able to reap the benefits of learning and likening and remembering the scriptures and the words of the prophets. And when you link it to the world around you, it's an enhanced way of learning that I enjoy. So it also says, while the man who has not the spirit of God will see nothing godlike in the occurrences or nothing which he will accept as a fulfillment of prophecy. So I would rather be that first man that sees the hand of God than to be the one who sees nothing. All right, so we have the seven-year great American eclipses path. These eclipses are so amazing because there are exactly seven eclipse years between them. And if you look at the path of totality, it looks like the sun and the moon together are drawing one holy marks over two holy places during three holy times. So we will be looking at the holy marks, the holy places, and the holy times crossing over the holy land of America, a covenant land. So In 2017, we have the first total eclipse visible only from the modern mainland United States since 1257. So there are other eclipses, but that is the first that can only be seen by Americans. So we have four holy marks over the covenant land of America. Now take a minute to think about that. If you are a temple going person, just ponder on that. And that's all I'm going to say about the temple connection. But let's continue on and just look at this picture that is being drawn onto the earth. We have one olive and three tabs. So we know that God uses signs and symbols to speak. And the olive in Hebrew, this is old Paleo Hebrew. It's like an A of the alphabet. So in old Paleo Hebrew, it is actually known to be God's signature. 
The Aleph is the first letter of the alphabet. The Aleph has a numerical value of one. It represents the oneness of God, the one true God. And it's made of three lines, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The number three biblically represents wholeness, completeness, perfection. You can see here it also looks like a compass that is used for careful planning and creation. And we know that God created the earth. So right here you can see there are three cross sections or marks on the earth where the solar eclipses intersect, one over the water, one over Illinois, and one over Texas. So something that I discovered, this is also something that I just found on my own and I was so excited. I shouldn't say my own. I do feel like the spirit points these things out to me because it just makes my heart sore and it just reminds me that God created everything and his signature is all over. So this is amazing. If you look at the first eclipse that happened, one of the first, like the very first, you can see right here, city that it started at was Salem, Oregon. So we know that Salem, like Jerusalem, Salem means peace. And peace is often a symbol and, a, and connected to the Holy Ghost. We also have this cross section over here in the left corner starts in the water. And that fits in so beautifully because water is a symbol of the Holy Ghost. And so you have I know in a past video, I showed how a lot of people online pointed out this idea. So I didn't discover the Salem's. People found that there were, it was saying seven Salem's. But I was able to actually pull it up on the NASA website and then take those files and convert it into the Google Earth website. This was actually done through the help of Jared at Christian Homestead, who has been amazing at helping me figure out how to do this. And it's really cool because then we know that these markers are exactly correct according to NASA and Google Earth. And you can see all the cities that land within the path of totality. So we have, I actually found eight Salem's. I think the different one that was left off of, I noted this in a previous video, was this Tennessee Salem right here. And this Salem, Wyoming is more of like a little township rather than a city. So not all of these are exactly in totality, but if you just look at it as a line that is drawing, it crosses over some important things too, including church sites. So I feel like there's still significance in looking at the overall picture that's drawn. And you have eight Salem's of peace going this way, the first eclipse. The second eclipse, it was very significant. It crossed squarely over the church headquarters of Jesus Christ. So the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is centered here in Utah, and it was going squarely over Utah. And the first area that it crosses here, it's a place called Gardiner, Oregon. And I thought that was amazing if you're looking at this path as being Jesus Christ, because Mary, after Jesus was resurrected, thought that Christ was the gardener, that he was tending to the gardens, and she did not recognize him at first. And as you cross down this way, you have a cross point here and at the very end of this line is Corpus Christi, Texas. And you can see right in the middle of this totality at the very end, you have Corpus Christi, which means the body of Christ. And there are no cities that are named Jesus, but this idea of the body of Christ, we have the resurrection. So the resurrection right here and all the way at the end, we have Mary who sees Jesus and thinks he's the gardener and then recognizes him. And for our final eclipse, this is the eclipse that is coming up soon. And I'm gonna show how some people have pointed out this is a Nineveh judgment eclipse. So we're gonna talk about why people are saying this and all of the Nineveh cities that are along this path. We have a Jonah, it starts with Jonah, and then all of the Ninevehs. I'm also gonna show how there are a lot of cities and signs pointing to the idea of the eagle and the gathering. So actually eagles and vultures and birds and gathering. And it's kind of interesting because if you think about this line as representing God the Father we have on this path, we know that God the Father appeared to Joseph Smith in New York and it crosses right 
over this area where Joseph Smith had the first vision. All right, so we looked at the olive. Now let's take a look at the three holy top marks. So in Revelation 22, 13, it says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. So the Tav is like Z of the Hebrew alphabet. The Tav could be translated as mark or sign. So how cool is that? It's the last letter in the actual meaning of it. You'll see it trans the word, the Hebrew Tav can be translated as the word for mark or sign in the scriptures. So in the Hebrew alphabet, every letter also has a numerical value and the numerical value for the Tav is 400. And I found that to be pretty cool because the sun is 400 times larger than the moon and the moon is 400 times closer to the earth than the sun so this is what makes them appear equal in size allowing for solar eclipses to even happen so these two oh wow that <laughs> just jump for there we go Sorry about that. So those two coincidences are not related to each other. It just, if you talk to an astronomer, they'll tell you that that's just a big coincidence. Like how, how lucky, what a cool coincidence that we actually get solar eclipses because of this 400 coincidence. So is it a grand coincidence or God's creation signature? You decide. And then if you take the olive and the tav together, the olive tav, you can see it right here, is actually Jesus's hidden signature in Hebrew. It is untranslated because it would look like just writing AZ, and that would be nonsensically inserted all over the Bible. So for instance, in Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God, and then if you translated the olive tav and wrote it down, it would just be AZ which means all of top hidden signature of Jesus Christ created the heaven and the earth. And I've talked a little bit more about this in previous videos, but here you see these cross X marks, Tavs, three of them. So we have the Aleph, one Aleph and three Tavs. And we have our eight Salem's of peace, the water pouring out of the Holy Spirit. We have God, the father appearing with this, in this area and then over here we have the body of christ corpus christi in this area so let's think celestial celestial luminaries marking churches holy places so the path of the seven year american eclipses totality i found that this was kind of interesting so the totality will mark nine holy sites from church history and the last april 8th 2024 eclipse that's soon coming will happen on the exact 99th day of the year. And this is also the year that our current prophet, President Nelson, is 99 years old. So I have a few nines there. And like I said before, if you want to see more, if you want to learn how to look up this path of totality and how to do it and just get more information and go in depth about the sign of Jonah and the sign of Nineveh, definitely go ahead and check out Jared's channel at Christian Homestead. You can see right here, he talked about how there was actually in real life, a person not that long ago that was swallowed by a well and he was on Jimmy Kimmel and some other cells, a boy that got pulled out in this big miracle. His name is Jonah. Anyways, he makes some interesting connections as well. So if you're not familiar with his channel, check out Christian Homestead for sure. So the April 8th, 2024 path of solar eclipse totality, we have number one, Palmyra, New York. So you can see right here, Pat, this is the eclipse that's coming up. We have the sacred grove. This was the site of the first vision where Joseph Smith saw Jesus Christ and God the Father. Number two, right here, you can see this is Fayette, New York. This was the birthplace of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so where it was first organized. And this is also where we had the completion of the Book of Mormon. And number three, down here, this is Kirtland, Ohio. So this is where we had our first temple, the Kirtland Temple. And Jesus, Moses, Elijah, and Elias restored the sacred keys and authority of the priesthood and power of Jesus Christ upon the earth. Once again, it had been lost through corruption in time. So 
we had that restored back to just like in the days when Jesus Christ was alive and he had his apostles. So we have number four, Menden, New York, and we have the early homes of Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball here. This is the church site that you can visit. We have number five, Hiram, Ohio. So that's down here. The headquarters of the church, the Johnson Farm, and the site of many revelations. And then number six, we have Amherst, Ohio. This is where Joseph Smith was ordained president of the high priesthood at a conference here. And then if we go back in time to August 21st, the first eclipse in 2017, the totality passed over these amazing places. So number seven site, we have Adam on Diamond, Missouri. This was where God talked with Adam and the place where Adam offered up sacrifices to the Lord, according to Joseph Smith, as revealed to him by God. And number eight, we have the Independence Visitor Center, Missouri. So this is the future site of the New Jerusalem Temple. And number nine, we have Far West, Missouri, and we know that the Lord revealed the full name of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints here. And we've recently learned from President Nelson how important that name is and that we use it. And we also know that they began to establish a stake of Zion and build a temple here. So how cool that this eclipse covers all of our most important church sites. And let's take a look at all seven dispensation heads. So we know that this is an amazing time, the last dispensation, the dispensation of the fullness of times. If you do a study on what the prophet and apostles have been saying about this lately, it's pretty amazing. We're living in really exciting times. And so if you're looking at this thinking, well, there's lots of places with these names. I wrote down how many places there are that actually have these names. And you'll see that it's a pretty big coincidence if it's just a coincidence because there are only two places in the United States named Adam. One of them is right here, right on that eclipse line. We have seven places in the world named Enoch. Yeah, here we have it. There are only six places in the world named Noah. Now Noah's not quite in the totality, but very, very close. Only nine places in the whole world named Abraham. We have it right here. Eight places in the entire world named Moses. There we go right there. This is the also known as the Little Egypt area where it intersects. And there are zero places in the United States named Jesus, but there is one Corpus Christi, which means the body of Christ. And here we have it right in the center of totality and right at the end of this line here. And we have four places in the United States named Joseph. And one of them happens to be right smack dab in the middle of this line. All right, so this dispensation, let's look at a few dispensation quotes. Marvelous work and a wonder and the gathering of Israel. So Elder Uchtdorf in 2022, he said, it is the work of loving and serving God. It is loving and serving God's children. In this way, we see in our lives a fulfillment of the prophecy of the Apostle Paul. In the dispensation of the fullness of times, God will gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him. And now I think this is actually the footnote of this part of the talk. So if you go to the BYU Citation Index, you can look up all of the past general conference talks and the footnotes that they included to be connected to their words. So we also have Elder Anderson in October General Conference 2021, the name of the church. He says, the identity and destiny of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints require that we be called by his name. I was recently in Kirtland, Ohio, where the prophet Joseph Smith, with only a few members of the church, prophesied, this church will fill North and South America. It will fill the world. The Lord described the work of this dispensation as a marvelous work and a wonder. A side note, we'll be talking about how President Nelson on January 1st emphasized this year as being marvelous. So he spoke of a covenant that would be fulfilled in the latter days. So we are still looking. The covenant is not fully fulfilled, allowing all of the earth to be blessed. So we're in a process, but we're still seeing many miracles ahead of us. In April 2024 and August 2017, we have an intersection in Little Egypt, Illinois. So if you look right here, 
I found some really crazy and interesting connections. So I think you'll enjoy this. So first of all, the county exactly where this intersects is called Jackson County, Illinois. We know that Jackson County, Kansas, that same name is where the New Jerusalem is. We also have this area is called Little Egypt. So in Southern Illinois, their mascot is the Saluki. So the Southern Illinois Salukis. And Saluki is a royal Egyptian dog. That's pretty interesting because in the Bible, dog is used to distinguish Gentile from Jew. This was just a known Hebraism that they called the Gentiles dogs. And in 3 Nephi 7 and 8, well, first of all, in Matthew 15, 27 and Philippians 3, 2, you can read about these references to dogs. And you also had the time um, when the Savior mentioned that, you know, the woman who was asking for food was asking for scraps. And even the dogs get scraps. And so Jesus blessed this woman, even though she was a Gentile. So 3 Nephi 7, 8, it says, And thus six years more had not passed away since the more part of the people had turned from their righteousness like the dog to his vomit or like the sow to her wallowing in the mire. So when we look at dogs and pigs, it's generally, it's a negative connotation having to do with the Gentiles in the sense that it's warning us against materialism and secularism and things of the physical that we are not paying attention to the spiritual things enough. So it's kind of interesting because right here we have Lake Moses in this little Egypt area. And the exact point where this intersection is, and I'll show you on a future slide, how it's exactly over Cedar Lake. And very near Cedar Lake is a tiny place called Makanda. It kind of sounds like that movie Civil War where they have the Wakanda and all the special things about Wakanda, but we have Makanda. And then the closest real city, not just a tiny town, is Carbondale, Illinois. So we will be looking at each of these things and how they might be significant. So I left here. It's kind of interesting. If you think of this as little Egypt, you have Joseph right here and the body of Christ. So in the little Egypt area, it's pretty fascinating as far as history goes and possible connections to the Book of Mormon. According to some, we have the ancient Cahokia mounds and the largest pyramids in the United States, right in that spot. We also have its, uh, burial site of a man. He's called the Birdman buried here, and he's buried on a bed of shells. And there are various inscriptions referring to him as the Birdman. So we have ancient Little Egypt mounds in the heartland of America. So it was actually pretty interesting as I was creating this. So actually the very day that I was creating this slide about Little Egypt, I saw on um, this channel, this is um, an LDS channel. His name is Troy and his channel is the last dispensation and he goes into depth. So he is interviewing this. I think his name is Jay Johnson perhaps, but he, I guess, is an expert and very knowledgeable about the Cahokia mountains. And so these Cahokia mountains are very close to this cross section solar eclipse area. And if you want to learn more, just watch this video and you have the Birdman burial mound. So you can see picture of these great big mounds that are still here that you can go visit. This is one of the artifacts they have of the Birdman. So let's talk about the Lost Ten Tribes. But before we dive into that, I want to show you this little clip that's from another LDS channel called The Stick of Joseph. And they do a really great job pointing out evidences for the Book of Mormon, including this clip where Tucker Carlson basically says that there is some validity to the Book of Mormon and that he was going to stop making fun of it. So here we go. Why is there such institutional resistance to acknowledging that we don't know certain things? Here in North America, there are certain archaeological ruins, say the state of Missouri, um, that were not built by the descendants of the current American Indians, we know that, that are, one of them's a mile long, yeah. a mile long, in Missouri now. Yeah. It's almost nothing. Like, I've never learned any of this in school. It's all totally real. Look it up. It's on Wikipedia, which is the most CIA-controlled yeah. information source in the world. What does it look like? It's it's a it's a mound. It's a tell. You know, 50 feet high or something, I'm guessing. Well, they're happening. finding stuff all, all over. We have Jimmy Corsetti coming on. There's stuff all over. So there's a overwhelming evidence. Well, there's proof that there were massive population centers mm -hmm. 
in North America long before 1492. So, what? What? Yeah. The only, all I'm saying, the only thing we know well, for sure. Well, the Mormons have the Book of Mormon. They say that that was yes. the, the history of those people. The Ten Lost Tribes of Israel came right. to the United States. And I've certainly spent a lot of my life making fun of that, but I'm going to stop. Yeah. All right, so pretty interesting. So let's get into the topic of the Lost Ten Tribes. So Article of Faith, number 10, for the churches, we believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the Ten Tribes, that Zion, the New Jerusalem, will be built on the American continent, that Christ will reign personally upon the earth, and that the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisiacal glory. In Hosea 11.1, 1, it reads, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And the sword shall abide on his cities and shall consume his branches and devour them because of their own counsels. And my people are bent to backsliding from me. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? They shall tremble as a bird out of Egypt. So remember, Ephraim is part of the lost ten tribes. We know that some of them traveled to America and... I find this scripture interesting because we have these topics that I've kind of been tying in that seem to be connected to this eclipse of Egypt and trees. We're going to talk about Cedar Lake. That's exactly where the cross section is. So this idea of trees being burned and cut down. And if you remember from my past video where I talked about Josiah and backsliding. Um, and so it's a question. It's related to Ephraim. We know that we here in America, members of the church, we are of Ephraim. Many of us are. And it says that they shall tremble as a bird out of Egypt. So we have the bird man, we have Egypt, and we have a lot more bird symbolism coming up to talk about. So we know that President Nelson, he keeps telling us that the gathering is now. He talks about this all the time. I would say dare say it's one of his main messages. He talks about it over and over. So President Russell Nelson declared, the Lord is hastening his work to gather Israel. That gathering is the most important thing taking place on earth today. Nothing else compares in magnitude. Nothing else compares in importance. Nothing else compares in majesty. And Wendy Nelson said, we often talk about living in the latter days. We are, after all, latter-day saints. But perhaps these days are more latter than we have ever imagined. So we know that the last dispensation, it's a time of gathering. It's miraculous and marvelous. And in 2 Nephi 25, 17, it says, And the Lord will set his hand again the second time to restore his people from their lost and fallen state. Wherefore, he will proceed to do a marvelous work and a wonder among the children of men. So on January 1st of this year, President Nelson gave a special message that he posted on social media, and it's longer than this, but this is just one of the little sections. He said, may we strive this new year to marvel and rejoice at the privileges and opportunities our Father in Heaven and our Redeemer Jesus Christ provide. And the interesting part about this is he goes on to talk about marvelous and marvel. And he actually repeats the word marvel seven times in this message. And that was given on January 1st, 2024. All right. As we're talking about the 10 tribes, this is wild. You guys, 241 years from the revolt of Rehoboam. So if we're looking at the 10 tribes, the 10 tribes were scattered 241 years after they revolted from Rehoboam, the king. Now, if we're looking to parallels and likening this to ourselves, it gets pretty wild because 241 years from the U.S. revolt, we have the eclipse dates. So 2017 and 2020-24. So I feel like we have a prophet that's talking about the gathering of Israel and we have some numbers pointing to the gathering that parallels the scattering. So let's take a look what I found online here. It says, by issuing the Declaration of Independence adopted by the Continental Congress on July 4th, 1776, we celebrate this every year, guys, the 13 American colonies severed their political connections to Great Britain at this time. But this was actually just 
the beginning of an approximately seven year time period because seven years after that, we have the Treaty of Paris, which finalized this process. So what did the Treaty of Paris of 1783 actually do? Well, the Treaty of Paris was signed by the US and British representatives on September 3rd, 1783, ending the War of the American Revolution. So based on a 1782 preliminary treaty, the agreement recognized United States independence and granted the United States significant Western territory. So if you add 241 to this date of 1776, you have 2017. And if you add 241 to 1783, you get 2024. And this one is exactly down to the month parallel to this. So you have 240 years and seven months. And you see here from Josephus Antiquities, um, it says that it was seven months, 240 years and seven months after that they had revolted from Rehoboam. So that's pretty interesting. All right. So if you take a close look at this intersection where we talked about Maconda and Cedar Lake, you also have this really cool place. It's called the Bald Knob Cross of Peace. This is a place that tourists can come and visit. And this was the largest cross in the Western Hemisphere at the time it was erected. And it's called the Cross of Peace. The project began in 1948. This was the same year that Israel gathered and declared its independence. As you can see here on May 14th, 1948, the Jews proclaimed their independence. And the Bald Knob Cross of Peace, they started this project in 1948 by raising funds and gathering 116 people together. I found that kind of interesting. We also have at this eclipse intersection of 2017 and 2024, so this cross is being completed very soon. This is exactly over Cedar Lake, and it's near Maconda. Maconda, we're going to talk about how Maconda is related to vultures and eagles as a gathering place. So if you look at the up close, this is this area zoomed in here on the right. You can see this Cedar Lake. This looks really cool, a body of water called Cedar Lake. And Maconda is a place where vultures and eagles gather. Okay, so what is the tiny town of Maconda known for? If you look it up, it's very tiny. It really isn't known for anything except for this. They have Vulture Fest every year. Vulture Fest, it is a spot where people come from all over the world to see hundreds of vultures gather. It is also an eagle watching spot where eagles are prolific. And this immediately reminded me of one of my favorite scriptures of all times. I love Doctrine and Covenants 88, but quite possibly second to that would be this scripture. I have always loved the scripture. Um, there's so much depth. I could do a whole video about what the scripture means, but the second coming vulture eagle gathering parable. So in the Joseph Smith translation, Matthew 24, 28, he's telling us basically about the second coming and what to look for. In verse 27, he says, for as the light of the morning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, and covereth the whole earth, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And now I shew unto you a parable. So this is the parable. Behold, wheresoever the carcass is, so you have the carcass, dead bodies, there will be the eagles or vultures. It can be translated either way. will be gathered together. So likewise shall mine elect be gathered from the four quarters of the earth. And another interesting note about this four quarters is that eclipse that crosses Utah also crosses the place in the United States known as the four corners. So the four quarters, the four corners. Verse 29 says, and they shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Behold, I speak unto you for mine elect's sake. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famine and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. So I looked up at all the various translations and I found 25 translations of the Bible that use the word vulture and seven of them use the word eagle. So here you have the eagle. This is right at the cross section of the upcoming eclipse, a gathering place 
of vultures and eagles. And this, I think, is really cool for a second coming parable, because if you look at it from the aspect of the vultures, as in the judgment and the terror, and you think of a corrupt nation and kingdom that is dying and and kind of withering from within and the vultures are gathering. They see this corruption. They see this weakness happening. So you have the judgment, but then the eagles, you also have the gathering of the elect and you have eagles are known for seeing for their sight, for their wisdom and seeing things from afar off. They have great eyesight and the eagles. It also connects to a lot of various prophecies and symbolism. So let's dive into some of that. So, I actually find it really cool. I've been aware of this for some time, and I think it's really amazing that President Nelson was born on the holy day, 13 Condor. So this is a holy day on the ancient America sacred rounds. This is an Aztec Mayan calendar from ancient times. So he was born on 13 Condor. And the Condor is a vulture. It's a very regal vulture, and it flies higher than the eagle. So President Nelson, he tells us, my dear extraordinary youth, you were sent to earth at this precise time, the most crucial time in the history of the world to help gather Israel. So we need the eagles to help gather up the elect to spread the gospel and the truth. And let's take a look at the Ezra Eagle last day's prophecy. So in the church's Bible dictionary, it says among these books, the following are of special value. So we have the first book of Esdras. It contains an account of Josiah's, remember we talked about Josiah in the last video, religious reforms and the subsequent history down to the destruction of the temple. And the destruction of the temple is basically uh, the time of the abomination of desolation. And we know that that is a multiple fulfillment event. There will be another event and fulfillment of that in the future. So in the second book of Esdras, it contains seven visions or revelations made to Ezra. So the Lord through Joseph Smith said of the apocryphal writings, therefore, whoso readeth it, let him understand. And for the spirit manifesteth truth and whoso is enlightened by the spirit shall obtain benefit therefrom. So we know that the apocrypha, there are gems that we can retain through the use of the spirit and it actually Ezra's in particular used to be a part of the bible but is no longer a part of the canonized bible as we use it today so in second Ezra's, let's just read a little bit about this idea of the eagle and the latter days it says i kept looking and saw the eagle flying with its wings to rule over the earth and over those who lived on the earth i saw how everything under heaven was made to submit to it and no one opposed it So the eagle is representative of a ruling, a nation with a lot of power in the world. You hated those who spoke the truth and loved liars. You destroyed the dwelling of those who bore fruit and tore down the walls of those who had done you no harm. Your insolence has ascended to the most high and your pride to the mighty one. The most high has reviewed his times. Look, they are finished and his ages are complete. Therefore, eagle, you must utterly vanish. So it sounds to me like it's talking about a nation that became too prideful and was not treating other nations fairly or the way that the way that they should be treated. And so God is saying, look, your time is over. And we know in Ezra Eagle that once the nation, the ruling nation of the Eagle is basically denigrated and loses its power over time. That is what happens right before the ushering in of the kingdom of God. So let's keep reading. It says, look, they are finished and his ages are complete. So the final dispensation. Then it reads, therefore, eagle, you must utterly vanish. Then the whole earth will be refreshed and restored, set free from your violence and will hope for the judgment and mercy of him who made it. So that sounds a lot like the millennium to me. Let's take a look at this. Ezra Eagle prophecy and idea for a minute and compare it to things that are happening on the earth today. So 2020, we know President Nelson told us was a hinge point in history. There was also a hinge point eclipse. It was on the exact midpoint of the seven year great American eclipses. So could this possibly be an Ezra Eagle related hinge point eclipse? Maybe. Take a look. I lean towards yes. 
that you look at the evidence and decide for yourself by the spirit what you think. So August 21st, 2017 eclipse, that was the first one. We have exactly seven eclipse years or 346 days, draconic years, and they both land on Mondays or Mondays. So 346 times seven, that goes from this 2017 to April 2024, and has a span of 2,422 days. So our midpoint or hinge point eclipse day is Monday, or sorry, is Monday, December 14th, 2020. And we know on December 14th, 2020, on the day of the eclipse, this was the exact day that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are certified by the Electoral College on this day. And we're about to have our 2024 eclipse, and we are about to have a 2024 election. Now, it's pretty interesting because the Ezra Eagle prophecy talks about the ruling nations. So it says Biden was certified by Electoral College on the midpoint eclipse day. Will he be removed from the race before the election during the final American 2024 Eagle eclipse time period? Is he the short feather? So I don't, I'm not going to go into the whole idea of Ezra Eagle, but look it up. There's a lot online about it. You can read about it, study it. And the, one of the interpretations is that each of the feathers represents a president and eventually there are short feathers. And if you interpret it in a certain way, it looks like Biden may be a short feather in the sense that he will be removed. He won't continue on to the election. So it's pretty interesting because if you look at the headlines of today, I just pulled this up and on February 12th, the headlines are saying this, Kamala Harris ready to serve as Democrats sound the alarm about Biden's age. Kamala Harris says she is ready to serve as Biden faces age scrutiny. And Harris says she's ready to serve amid questions about Biden's age. So People are already talking about Biden not being fit to serve as the next president. Right here at the bottom, you can see here just an example of how Ezra Eagle prophecy and Biden connection is all over the internet. So Ezra Eagle prophecy and Biden removed. So that is going to happen soon and we'll see. Does Biden make it to the election? Will he even get a chance to serve as president? If this Ezra Eagle interpretation is correct, the answer is no. So the Ezra Eagle prophecy, the kingdom of the world collapses before the kingdom of God reigns. We also had a prophet named Ezra Taft Benson, and these were his words of wisdom. He said, too often we bask in comfortable complacency and rationalize that the ravages of war, economic disaster, famine, and earthquake cannot happen here. Those who believe this are either not acquainted with the revelations of the Lord or they do not believe them. Those who smugly think these calamities will not happen, that they will somehow be set aside because of the righteousness of the saints, are deceived and will rue the day that they harbored such a delusion. The Lord has warned and forewarned us against a great tribulation and given us counsel through his servants on how we can be prepared for these difficult times. Have you or we heeded this counsel? And finally, let's take a look at Ezekiel 17. So I'm really happy. I had an email that I received from Ambrosia and she shared this connection with me and I thought it was awesome. So it's actually a last day's riddle of fowl and cedar trees, both of which things are centered around this eclipse section date. So it says, son of man put forth a riddle and speak a parable unto the house of Israel, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, A great eagle with great wings, long-winged, full of feathers, which has diverse colors, came unto Lebanon, and took the highest branch of the cedar. So there are three key elements of this riddle or parable in Ezekiel. So one, we have a majestic eagle adorned with vibrant feathers. It seizes a cedar branch. Cedars are known for being tall and strong. And you think of them as like, they're so strong that they'll last forever. Establishing it as a sapling in a flourishing setting. Number two, an alternative seedling is planted in a fertile location, but despite the conducive surroundings, fails to reach its full potential and transforms into a mere low-hanging vine. 
And number three, you have a distinct eagle captures the vine's aspirations, desiring nourishment from it, despite the vine being an already abundant environment. So rather than extending its roots towards the plentiful body of water in the east, the vine extends westward in hope of being hand-fed by the monochromatic eagle or Egypt. So remember Egypt, materialism, secularism, looking to the things of the world rather than to God. So kind of inherent in the underlying theme behind this is this question. Does a kingdom like that, corrupt and weak, deserve to live in this very plentiful area or should it be uprooted and destroyed? It ends on a high note, though, where the kingdom of God gathers the righteous Jews and the Gentiles. So if you read Ezekiel, it poses the riddle. The middle section gives the interpretation. And then the very last part, um, you know, Jesus Christ, when he was giving bad news, he often used parables to explain things that people might not want to hear. And at the very end, though, there's always this idea that grace and hope and love will trans will just overcome. So in verse 23, it says, in the mountain of the height of Israel, will I plant it and it shall bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a goodly cedar and under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing in the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell. So we have the righteous who are gathered together and all fowl of every wing kind of harks the idea of the righteous Jews and Gentiles of all kinds, people all over the world gathering together for the millennium. So in the last days, we have this idea of the cedars of Lebanon being cut down. So in 2 Nephi chapter 12, verse 12, it says, For the day of the Lord of hosts soon cometh upon all nations, yea, upon every one, and upon the proud and lofty, and upon every one who is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. Yea, and the day of the Lord come upon all the cedars of Lebanon, for they are high and lifted up. I love how the Book of Mormon gives clarification to the Bible. So we have the cedars of Lebanon being distinguished as the proud and lifted up nations. And then in Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 5, it reads, But if ye will not hear these words, I swear by myself, saith the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. And I will prepare destroyers against thee, every one with his weapons, and they shall cut down thy choice cedars and cast them into the fire. And in Isaiah 37, verse 24, it reads, By thy servants hast thou reproached the Lord, and I will cut down the tall cedars thereof. Cedars, proud, are being cut down. And just to remind you, let's look at that picture one more time. This close-up right here, X mark the spot, is exactly over this body of water called Cedar Lake. This is a close-up of what's happening right here. With the upcoming eclipse about to intersect this other eclipse. All right, and last but not least, we're going to talk about Carbondale, which is the biggest city that's close to this intersection of the two eclipses. It's called Carbondale, Illinois. So I actually grew up in Illinois, not near Carbondale. Love the state. Um, but it says there are six years, six months, six weeks, and six days between the first and last American solar eclipses. That's just an interesting fact. And um, we also know that a carbon atom consists of six protons, six electrons, and also six neutrons. So we know that carbon is the universal building block for life as we know it, and that carbon is the main component of soil organic matter. And all throughout the scriptures, the Lord compares man to being of the dust and the clay of the earth. So we know that six, the number of man. So Genesis 2, verse 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And in 2 Nephi 8, 24, it says, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, arise, sit down, O Jerusalem, loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. So this sounds to me like God is telling us to arise from the dust, to shake off the natural man. Whatever natural man tendency, bad habit, addiction is 
binding the bands of your neck to do whatever you can to break yourself from those sins because we are transitioning into the time of Zion and the New Jerusalem. All right, so October 2023 and April 2024 eclipse crossover point. So if you look at this intersection of eclipses, so this was the eclipse right here. You have the upcoming April 2024 eclipse. And this eclipse right here was the October 14th, 2023 eclipse. This is the eclipse that happened exactly one week after the October 7th attack of Israel. So if you highlight this area right here, zoom it in, try to figure out what is going on at this exact crossing point. I found the closest label names on Google Earth were Vanderpool and Utopia. So again, pull this idea of water, but Vanderpool, Texas. So again, you always have these Indian places. So the Apache, Apaches, I might not be saying that correctly, were known to have established villages in the vicinity. Bird watchers come annually from around the nation and foreign countries. So again, there's this kind of theme of birds. Bird watchers are known to come from all over to this spot. And here you have Utopia. Now, when I hear Utopia, it reminds me of Zion. So what is Utopia, Texas famous for? I looked it up. It says, welcome to Utopia, Texas. We are known for wonderful birding year round. So again, bird theme keeps popping up at these specific locations. And it's kind of interesting because this eclipse right here, this is the upcoming April eclipse. If you look at where it ends, so this very, the last piece of land that it touches before shooting into the water, it's called South Bird Island. So you have North Bird Island right here, Puffin viewing site. And again, the bird theme, the idea of the gathering of birds, gathering of eagles and vultures and fowl of all kinds at the end of the day is very cool. And if you look at the very beginning of that same solar eclipse, so the first land touched by 2024 eclipse is in Mexico. It's called Ejido Francisco Villa, meaning Zion or Utopia and land free man. So if you look at this name, so Ejido, you can see it right here, the close up of what is going on right here. If you zoom in, you see right here. So a hedo definition meaning it is a tract of land held in common by the inhabitants of a Mexican village and farm cooperatively or individually. So you have this idea of cooperation that makes you think of Zion, Utopia. And uh, the Francisco part, I looked up what is the meaning of Francisco. The name of that man means free man. So you have Zion and freedom and the gathering of Israel, the gathering of Zion. And again, just like it's like a another version of what's happening at this intersection with the birds and the Utopia Zion theme. All right, so this is from my other video, but just a reminder, on April 8th, 2024, the solar eclipse will one, darken the sun, two, will darken the moon, and three, what makes this eclipse really kind of cool is that there will be a comet. See, I said the right word last time I said meteor, but it is a comet. I knew that. I just used the wrong term. But 12P Pons Brooks Comet, it will appear in the sky like a falling star, and it has a tail, and it should be visible to the naked eye. It'll be faint, not super spectacular to the naked eye, but you will, you should be able to see it, say astronomer. So in verse 34, it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Verily, I say unto you, this generation in which these things shall be shewn forth shall not pass away until all I have told you shall be fulfilled. So kind of cool that these things mentioned here are happening all on the same day. I also know that when it comes to comments, is it worth our time to keep our eyes on notable comments? Well, Joseph Smith said, then will appear one grand sign of the son of man in heaven, but what will the world do? They will say it is a planet, a comet, etc. but the son of man will come as a sign. So this is a revelation given to him on April 6th. And something that's actually, I, I think I left this off. Later, we're going to be talking about the holy times of eclipse. 
this is a big one that I, I did not add, but the holy times of the eclipse. So April 6th is the first day of general conference. And then we have the April 8th eclipse that's immediately after this weekend. And April 6th is also the beginning, the, the day of the organization of the church. And we have also been told through various prophets that it is the original birth date of Jesus Christ. So it was on this same day that he talks about this revelation about a comet. Kind of interesting. So when we're looking at this comet that's happening on the day of the eclipse, we have more bird and Zion millennium imagery. This is wild, you guys. Okay, so the bird gathering and the Zion utopia imagery is here once again with this comet. So more bird imagery and the falcon and the millennium. So if you look at what various, you know, websites and people are saying scientific america says millennium falcon comet sprouts icy wings as it loops so they're calling this the millennium falcon and then business insider says millennium falcon comet heading toward the earth and space weather says a comet shaped like the millennium falcon now i didn't include pictures of this but it's also being called the devil devil comet i find that interesting because the second coming we talked about kind of the vultures and death kind of relates to the devil, the judgment, the hard times for the wicked, and then for the righteous, the gathering and science. So the Millennium Falcon or the, the Millennium Falcon Comet versus the Devil Comet. So hopefully Millennium Falcon Comet is more what we're about rather than the judgments of the last days. All right, so the 2024 eclipse, the Jonah Nineveh eclipse. So this idea is actually all over the internet. And Christians of all types are talking about this. So it's very interesting because the original story of Jonah, people have shown that there was a really, really good chance that there was an eclipse associated with Jonah preaching repentance to Nineveh, telling them that they would be destroyed unless they repented. And that the idea is that there may have been an eclipse at that time. And if they saw the eclipse, it would have been a sign to them to know and to believe what Jonah was saying. So this is from Wikipedia. This is what it says. The Bur-Sagel eclipse occurred over the Assyrian capital of Nineveh in the middle of the reign of Jeroboam II, who ruled Israel from 786 to 746 BC. According to 2 Kings 14.25, the prophet Jonah lived and prophesied in Jeroboam's reign. The biblical scholar Donald Wiseman has speculated that the eclipse took place around when Jonah arrived in Nineveh and urged the people to repent, otherwise the city would be destroyed. This would explain the dramatic repentance of the people of Nineveh as described in the book of Jonah. Ancient cultures, including Assyria, viewed eclipses as omens of imminent destruction, and the empire was in chaos at the time. So people knew that there were problems at home struggling with revolts, famines, and two separate outbreaks of plagues. Do you see any parallels there? So I looked it up. I checked it. I went to Google Earth. I plugged in the NASA solar eclipse lines, and I found eight Ninevehs and one Jota. Now, they are not all in the path of totality, but they're very close. So if you think of it as maybe prioritizing the path, of the special church sites. You also have these in Nineveh surrounding it. And the first one here is Jonah. So one Jonah, eight Ninevehs. And in Matthew 12, 33, it says, then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered saying, master, we would see a sign from thee. So he wants them to just on their command, produce a sign. But Jesus answered and said unto them, there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. So it is a warning to a place that is living in wickedness. Something else that I find that's interesting that ties into this idea and theme of Jonah and the big fish. We have the location of April 2024 eclipse is in Pisces, the fish. So this idea of gathering and also the Jonas. Um, so it looks like if you look right here, it looks like a beautiful depiction of the cord that is bound to the sea dragon Cetus. So you have, right now we're in the Chinese year of the wood dragon. The last time we had a wood dragon, that was when Kamal Harris was born. And 
you see the sea dragon and these are the cords binding the two fish and the eclipse. It's like it's freeing this fish from the sea dragon's talons. So the story of Jonas, the big fish, for me, it just, I mean, all these things that I look, they don't have to mean anything to you and maybe they don't mean anything to the world. But to me, learning in this way, it just reminds me that the story of Jonas reminds me that Jesus died so that I can be saved from the awful monster of sin and death. So when that eclipse occurs, I'm going to think about how I am saved from the awful monster of sin and death and praise God and give glory to him for everything, this world, the planets, the sun that he created for us and all the opportunities that through his grace, we're alive. We were created. We're here. We get to learn. We get to repent and we get to have access to the grace that he so freely gives us. So the gathering of the lost tribes will be a greater miracle than the parting of the Red Sea. This is kind of interesting if you think about it in the context of what our prophet, President Nelson, has said. He declared, in coming days, we will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen. He will bestow countless privileges, blessings, and miracles upon the faithful. Now, this really reminds me of Jeremiah chapter 16, 4. Because it makes the claim that in the last days, we'll see greater miracles than the parting of the Red Sea when the children of Israel were called out of Egypt. So let's read it. It says, it shall no more be said, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he had driven them. And I will bring them again into their land. That I gave unto their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. So again, this idea of the gathering of the lost tribes of Israel. Let's take a look at the holy timing of April 8th, 2024 eclipse. So number one, it's the day after general conference. So it's general conference weekend and then the following Monday is the eclipse. And remember, general conference weekend is also April 6th. The first day that is really awesome as that is when the church was organized and the birthday of Jesus Christ. And general conference is a time for holy gathering that's special to us as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Number two, it is also on the Hebrew holy day, the New Year Day, Nisan 1. So this is the Jewish ecclesiastical New Year. If you look in Exodus 12, 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. So here you go. Biblical New Year's Day, Nisan 1. And they remember at the start of the month, it's all about the exodus from Egypt. So again, this concept of Egypt and the Lord saving us from sins. And we're hoping in our day now that Jesus Christ will these last day's events will happen that he'll come and he'll save us from the grips of Babylon and the world and we'll transition into the days of the millennium. Number three, there are 40 days. We know 40 is a significant number between the eclipse and Pentecost. So usually 40 days is a day of kind of judgment or trials. And so if you don't include the start and the end date, it's the eclipse date and the day of Pentecost, there are 40 days sandwiched in between. Okay, number four. So the holy timing of April 8th, 2024 eclipse. Number four, it is the day after President Nelson's 40th anniversary of becoming an apostle. Number five, it is eight days after Easter. And number six, it is 14 days before Passover. So exactly two weeks from the eclipse, it'll be Passover. And seventh, it is the 99th day of the year of the same year that the prophet is 99 years old. And it finishes marking the nine holy church sites in the path of totality. And number eight, we have August 21st, 2017 eclipse was on President Monson's birthday. So that first great American eclipse was the prophet at the time and it was his birthday and he passed away soon after and president nelson became prophet so jared on christian homestead talks a lot about the bookends of president nelson be being tied into this eclipse and 
I really like this idea of it being eight days after, e after Easter. Number eight is my favorite number. And to me, it represents Jesus Christ. We have the seven days, but on the eighth day is the new day. It's the starting fresh. It's the day of resurrection. The day number eight reminds me of Jesus Christ and the millennium. So the year of 99, covenant to multiply in number. So if you look at Genesis 17, 1, it says, and when Abram was 90 years old and nine, so when he was 99 years old, the Lord appeared and said unto him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. So we know that in the last days, we talked about it earlier in the slides that there is a covenant and a marvelous work and a wonder, and it's the final gathering of Israel. And Abraham, he was told at 99 years old that God was going to multiply him exceedingly. And it's kind of interesting because our prophet is telling us and preparing us for multiplication. So we just received new mission presidents and companions called to serve the beginning of 2024. We are getting 144 new mission presidents and companions. So when the millennium does come, there are going to be a lot of people joining to the church that are realizing the truth of the gospel. Doctrine and Covenants 4538, even so it shall be in that day when they shall see all these things, then shall they know that the hour is nigh. And they shall see signs and wonders, for they shall be shown forth in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. The Book of Mormon has a warning specifically about signs and wonders. In 3 Nephi 2, 1, it says, And it came to pass that the people began to forget those signs and wonders which they had heard, and began to be less and less astonished at a sign or wonder from heaven, insomuch that they began to be hard in their hearts and blind in their minds, and began to disbelieve all which they had heard and seen. I like this connection. For me, I'm going to use it as just the thought that God shows us signs and wonders in the heavens and the earth and all around us, all the blessings that we have. And so if we do see trials and harder times in the future, I will not forget all of the good things that we have been given, all the great things we have experienced and the signs and wonders above us and underneath our feet. President Eyring in 2020 had an amazing talk called Sisters in Zion. And he says, here is the Lord's revealed description of what would happen to Enoch's people and what will happen in this last dispensation of the fullness of times. And the day shall come that the earth shall rest. But before that day, the heavens shall be darkened and a veil of darkness shall cover the earth and the heavens shall shake and also the earth and great tribulation shall be among the children of men. This is the best part. It says, but my people will I preserve. That's a beautiful promise. We can hold on to that. Come what may. And righteousness will I send down out of heaven. And truth will I send forth out of the earth. To bear testimony of mine only begotten. His resurrection from the dead. Yea, and also the resurrection of all men. And righteousness and truth will I cause to sweep the earth as with a flood to gather out mine elect from the four quarters of the earth unto a place which I shall prepare, an holy city that my people may gird up their loins and be looking forth for the time of my coming, for there shall be my tabernacle, and it shall be called Zion, a new Jerusalem. So we have this testimony that comes forth out of the earth. And today we have a beautiful gift, the Book of Mormon, that came forth out of the earth, an ancient document that the prophet, Joseph Smith, the head of this final dispensation, translated so that we might hear the ancient story of America, a story that has been lost and covered up by the earth. That we There's a beautiful, beautiful message about the gathering and Zion and New Jerusalem as we studied the Book of Mormon this year. So please join the goal. We are going to finish reading the Book of Mormon by April 8th, 2024. So if you want to do that on top of your come follow me studies and go that extra mile, if you feel moved by the spirit, that'd be awesome. Otherwise, just be consistent and read the Book of Mormon every day. If you're not doing it, try to do it. Just leading up until April 8th, 2024. We know that the Lord loves effort. 
And until the coming of the Son of Man, verily, it is a day of sacrifice. Thanks for joining me today at Christian Fire Poppy Channel, where we bloom despite the doom and gloom like true fire poppies. A Zion field of many fire poppies will reduce erosion after fires. Join us for more fiery passion and preparedness as we fly together into the second coming of Jesus Christ.